First of all, um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Tina Camped. I am the director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women. And on behalf of the Barnard Center for Research on Women, on behalf of the Barnard faculty, students, and alums, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here and to really exclaim about the representation in this room. Um, we, uh, when we, we started planning this event a year ago, and I can tell you with great conviction that as we were planning it, it was never said, but I think there was an implicit assumption that we would be holding this event under other circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so those other circumstances, you know, a, a year ago, it was interesting to ponder the, the questions of activism that we were thinking about together. Um, but we had hoped that even in this moment, um, actually, that we would have be talking together with, um, on the basis of a much more optimistic, much more positive mood in the country and among ourselves. And so I have to begin by acknowledging that is that this is not the context in which we had hoped to be having this conversation. But the turnout tonight and all of the events from the last week or so have really amplified the need to have this conversation. Um, and I really need to, um, to thank you uh, for committing to come to this event this evening because the commitment that you have made to come here and to be in this place um, with so many other people is the commitment to do the most important kind of political activism that we all are responsible for doing, which is to engage in a dialogue. Um, and that really is the ground rules, the, the basic ground rule of this conversation, is that we want this conversation to be a dialogue. We also want it to be a respectful dialogue um, because we can disagree about anything but as long as our disagreement is based on respect, mutual ex respect, and mutual consideration, then we're okay. That is the basis of activism, that is the basis of politics, the way in which we want to be activists, and the way we want to be political. So I'm just here to welcome you, and I wanna say a few words about how we got here. Um, not how we got to this particular date and time, but how this uh, event came about because it was a really interesting journey. Um, it came about because two of the women on our panel, uh, Janet Price and Catherine Brewster, came to me just wanting to talk to me about a documentary and an oral history project that they had been producing together with their classmates from the class of 71. And that documentary really was about their activist journey as, uh, as a class that graduated during the tumultuous period of 1968 and the activities that were happening on Columbia and Barnard campus. And when we were talking, one of the things that they said was something that I heard um, when I started talking to students about, uh, about planning this event, which was that it was a struggle to come to their own awareness of their, political con of their political consciousness and their activism because it felt like they didn't necessarily have a collective of activists to draw on, right? That there is a disconnect, and that was the, um, that was the comments that I've heard over and over again from different activists on campus, that there was a kind of disconnect between earlier generations of Barnard activists and contemporary Barnard activists. And when I say activist, that was another point that actually came up in several of the uh, conversations, which is to say that there are different definitions of what activism means, and the only thing they have in common is the fact that each one of those individuals is striving to be a change agent. And what does it mean to be a change agent? Um, figuring that out, thinking about that collectively is really the point of this conversation. And it's the point of a conversation that we have to have now in order to move forward in January, right? So what I'm asking, what we're gonna be asking you to do is to actually listen and then reflect, and then to move forward with those reflections about what it would mean to support each other, 
what it would mean to draw on different generations of campus activists and, ca and legacies of campus activism in this particular moment in time, based on the histories of activism uh, that Barnard has been witness to and has been host to, and based on the contemporary moment that we find ourselves in when activism is going to be crucial to us surviving and for us to actually create the future we want to see in our lifetimes under the, the circumstances that we find most acceptable, most just, and most decent. So the run of the show is pretty straightforward. You are seated at tables because we want to have a conversation that begins on this panel, but moves to the table and then brings us all together in a larger conversation. So what we're first going to do is have uh, the members of the class of 71 present a short clip that gives us some historical context about a particular generation of activists. And we'll ask them, to, we're gonna use that as our jumping off point to think about the continuities um, that we share among activists of different generations. Then our, um, our moderator, Catherine Acey, is going to introduce our panelists and begin to bring them in dialogue on a conversation. Then we're gonna take a short break and transition to the tables. And we have a series of, of um, questions that we want you to discuss that bridge both the experiences of our current students and our alums with your own experiences and your own commitments to begin to actually have that kind of dialogue at your table. We hope that the tables themselves have a kind of diversity that is reflective of who you are. Um, and I'm looking at it, I think it is pretty reflective of who we are in this room. Then we want to come back with a quick round of feedback um, to actually t talk and address the things that have come up, but really, really quickly. Um, and then think about next steps and how to maintain this conversation, how to maintain this connection, and how to move forward. So the election is our backdrop and our foreground. It's our point of motivation in many ways. But it also, we can't think about it as an exception, right? This is part of a long history of activism, of social justice, justice activism that brings us together to think about strategies and allow us to learn from each other. So without further delay, I'm going to introduce our, um, oops, I don't have your introduction. I'm going to introduce our uh, moderator, Catherine Acey, who is a longtime social justice activism, activist, philanthropist, 23-year veteran and leader of Astra the Estrella Foundation, um, and also our social, our senior activist fellow at BCRW. She's ending a two-year tenure here where she has actually enriched us in multiple ways through her wisdom, her insight, and especially through her work that she's been working on while she's been in residence with us, which is a research, writing, and activist project on multi-generational activism. Please welcome Catherine Acey. It's a beautiful sight to behold. Thank you, Tina. I was delighted to be asked to be a um, moderator, as Tina said, this past uh, almost two years, been working on issues around aging and activism, but also how we build relationships across generations uh, in, in the spirit of building uh, social justice feminist movements. I, um, during this period, I've spoken in a number of colleges, including this one, in, in classes. I've, um, arranged, moderated, spoke on panels around some of the issues we'll be discussing tonight. I've interviewed activists in, working in nonprofits in, 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 and in a number of social justice movements. I've also conducted a salon of uh, women from five different generations, um, mostly uh, women of color, uh, activists uh, from various social movements. And a, a resounding refrain from all of these uh, panels, discussions, interviews, is a great desire and a yearning to develop shared understanding and acknowledgement and also honor the strength of each generation, something that we always don't get an opportunity to do. Also, it's not to uh, gloss over some of the tensions and conflicts and myths, if you will, um, but some of the real differences. Um, but how do we come to appreciate that and still build a wonderful, wonderful social justice movement. So um, tonight, we're going to look at and hopefully um, appreciate where we've come, 
where we are right now, I'm not asking you to appreciate where we are right now, maybe, <laughs> unless in this room with each other, um, and, but also to see how we're going to move forward and what that will look like. As uh, Tina said, we're gonna start with a film clip. So I'd like to introduce uh, one of our um, panelists, um, uh, Catherine uh, Brewster. She's wonderful, we share the same first name as you can see. Um, Catherine, this is the film, uh, a clip of the film you're about to see is her first uh, foray into the world of film. After 25 years working in the corporate world, she's been for 22 years the founder and director of the Atmos Center of Yoga and Healing. She's also the president of the class of 71. Catherine, please start us off. Hi, good evening, and thank you so very much for um, coming this evening. So um, the class of 1971 were fresh women in 1968 when the Columbia campus erupted. Um, it was the first of campuses across um, the United States to erupt in response to um, the Vietnam War and systemic racism. And for us, that was a formative experience. And then there was another formative experience, which was coming out of Barnard, graduating in 1971, into a world where doors were opening up for women, but not all the way. If you remember, the Civil Rights Act had been passed, and that included women. And as I said, although doors were opening up, we faced significant um, discrimination and many barriers. Feeling that our stories are the universal stories of college-educated women of our generation, our class set out to create an oral history collection. 77, 79 of our classmates out of, it's either 450 or 500 in the class agreed to be interviewed. These are life histories not just for these films, but life histories. They're in the Barnard archives for those of you that are interested in learning more about them. To, sh to tell the stories, to try and get a sense, give people a sense of what this experience has been like, we've created two films. Um, one is about the experience in 1968 to 71, um, how our life changed dramatically. And the current, the one you were gonna see is about coming out what that environment was like, and how a couple of us have been change agents um, in our life, or particularly our professional life, um, since then. So without further ado, um, gentlemen on the AV, would you please start the film? Uh, just in warning, you're gonna see two segments. We were not able to edit this, so there's the beginning, and then we're gonna fast forward to another segment, all right? It was such a short time in history. I mean, I don't think I was any less narcissistic than anybody, thinking, we're it, we're the generation. This is so big and so important. It was, it was big and important, but it was also little, and it was very short. That cohort of us that feels a certain way about the world and sort of had that experience. We were the first generation, I think, that really had choice. You could take any group of Barnard women that were friends and see how world events and our choices intersected. I feel like I went into the world when I went to Barnard and I never went back to a, a hidden place again. And that I understood that, you know, curiosity and uh, kind of fascination with what was around us was really Okay. There was a feminist that lived inside of me, a quiet one. You know, I wasn't running around burning bras. I wasn't being overt about it. But whether it's the right to have an abortion, whether it's free sex, whether it's equal opportunity at work, I mean, whatever it was, I was certainly for it. I think it was the attitude that women could do 
whatever they wanted to do, and that women were as capable as men. This idea of having your own money and being able to be independent, to be able to take care of yourself, was very important to my mother, and you know, it was in the air I breathed. I never wanted to be a boy, never, ever, but um, it's just that what men did was better. I said to myself, well, here I am, I'm young, but I'd like to have children. What is the career that would allow me time to do that? I wanted to get married. I mean, I saw myself getting married, but, you know, first get situated in the career and, you know, I mean, I didn't realize it would take me as long as it did. <laughs> it just never occurred to me that women should do whatever they would want to do. If you're really, really good at what you do, they're not going to waste your talents. They're not going to waste your talents. It's too, it's too important. We were really different, and the word that I became aware of was accountability. Your life is accountable to something bigger than yourself. My life has been about making a difference. I have seen now over the last 30 plus years that we're working in corporations that everyone really wants to make a difference. Most people wait till they retire early so they can actually make a difference. And we like to tap into that piece now and create a difference the corporation can make. And that sense of purpose also contributes to a bigger thing and people like to do things more than just creating shareholder value. I had a very good career in Hawaii. One of the things I'm proud of is that I discovered in, in living in Kailua, I, I'm a hiker, I, I love walking around, I love exploring, I always love exploring. I discovered this ancient Hawaiian sacrificial temple of a very ancient type in the midst of the Honolulu garbage dump. So here was this temple site that was teetering on the edge of the excavation that they had made to fill in the garbage. And they were filling in Honolulu's garbage. I thought that was awful. So we came up with a, a heritage name and we made a slideshow of the temple site and we went around to libraries and clubs and got ourselves gigs rabble-rousing, rabble-rousing for Hawaiian historic preservation and how could you have a garbage dump threatening an ancient Hawaiian archaeological site? Well, this was made for a cause. The Community Health Center movement was sort of being born as I entered medical school. Um, so I knew I wanted to do community health. I've spent my life at my health center, you know, doing, working. I mean, I do a lot of other things besides that, but I've been at the same health center for 34 years. I just love taking care of patients. I hope that I can be part of making sure that people will want to work at health centers and that there will be sort of a new generation of people stepping into that river. When you've been someplace 34 years, it's a knockout. <laughs> it's like amazing to know people for that long, to take care of multiple generations of people. It's amazing. I think I made the right choice and I'm doing what I do. I think I get uh, quite a bit of respect here, you know, in Baltimore for my background experience and all of that. You look around and white women run some of the CDFIs that are now in town. Uh, uh, but, you know, a lot of white men run them, too. Yeah. And a black woman. <laughs> so, you know, where, where you, you know, there are a couple of them around the country, a few. And then sometimes I think locally we get marginalized. Mm -hmm. You know, well, you know, they're just that small, you know, organization over there. But we do some of the hardest work in town. I mean, some of the hardest work in town. And we're doing the loans that nobody else will do, that the banks won't do. We do the ones that make sense in a neighborhood to, to restabilize the neighborhood. And those are the loans that aren't getting made to 
developers, whether they're black or white. Somebody has to step in and take that risk, and that's what we do here. All right, you can cut it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, you can view the whole video online um, at BC Voices. Say that. Say, say it in the it's, mic. Uh, bcvoices.org. Dot org. Okay. There's a link there that takes you to both films. Okay. Let the conversation begin. So I'm going to um, do some brief introductions. Um, the, this group is uh, quite distinguished. Um, I'm going to start on my left because it's always good to start on your left because perhaps you'll end up there as well. Um, so um, nothing wrong with this side of the room either, though. Um, so we've already met and introduced uh, Catherine. I would just want to add that uh, the yoga and healing center um, that you have been running for the past 22 years is here on the Upper West Side and is a haven for inner peace and quiet. I would imagine enrollment will increase um, <laughs> in the coming weeks. Um, over at the end, I'm glad you got here on uh, Carla. Carla is coming from out of town. We appreciate that. Um, I have too many papers here. I know I have your bio. Hang on here. Carla uh, is the Dean of Multicultural Affairs, Senior Diversity Officer, and Title IX Coordinator at no Trinity longer, College. No <laughs> so you can fix that out. Mix that it, I was going to say, this three that jobs. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Previously, um, Carla was the Associate Director of Students and Director of African American Student Affairs at Northwestern University the Assistant Dean of Students at Lake Forest, and the Director of Minor Minority Affairs, Associate Dean of the College, and Affirmative Action Officer at Harvard College. Harvard, yeah. thank you. Um, Janet Price, sitting uh, next to me. Uh, all, and all three of these folks are 71, uh, class of 71, and also on the board of BC. Um, voices. Uh, Janet has been immersed in education reform since 1981 as an education lawyer, po policy analyst, program innovator, helping start small schools at New York City nonprofits, a high school history teacher at a school for recent immigrants, founding principal of an inclusive, unscreened small public high school, a coach, facilitator, curriculum writer, and all purpose cheerleader for student-centered teaching and learning. She also um, is the co-author of the ACL, ACL, ACLU um, Rights of Students, something that some of you may be very interested in. Um, and over to the, at the very end, we have Dominique Ballou, who is a senior majoring in American Studies uh, from Compton, California. Currently, she is the president of the Black Theater Ensemble and member of the Bernard Organization of Soul Sisters. She is invested in expand, expanding our, um, archives collection and documenting and curating spaces that share non-dominant narratives. Next, next to Dominique is Nadia Mbundi, who is a senior. And I really need someone to help me with my papers. I'm so sorry, I apologize. Um, I, I almost have this memorized. Here we go. Uh, she was born in New Jersey to uh, Guyanese and Tanzanian parents. Nadia grew up in East and Southern Africa, the Caribbean, and Europe. She is a senior majoring in Africana studies and minoring in dance. She is a Mellon Fellow speaking fellow, founder, and president of Miscellaneous, the Multicultural International Student Club, and director of V-Day's 2017 production, which will focus on access and ability, centering on the narratives of, of students of color living with disabilities. From art, art to academia, activism has been an integral um, part of her work. And next to me is Rowan Kemp's 
Teeny. That's me. Thank you. Um, who is going to have to leave us early because Rowan is an activist and is acting tonight. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, Rowan is acting, is in a theater production. Um, <laughs> Rowan is a junior and is uh, majoring in women's gender and sexuality studies with a concentration in activist theater. Uh, they are currently the president of Gender Revolution Columbia's trans non-binary gender questioning advocacy and support group. Uh, Rowan is also a Barnard student admissions representative as well as one of the founding members of GLAD's campus ambassador program. They can be seen this coming weekend in um, special price tickets we have for those of you tonight um, in the Columbia University's player production of A Wrinkle in Time playing the role of Calvin. Thank you very much. So we, um, as Tina said, we're gonna start with a conversation. I'm gonna ask a, a few questions uh, before we come to you in about 25 minutes. Um, and then uh, have a close out. So first, I'm gonna ask you, Rowan. Sure. Uh, what does activism mean to you? All right, uh, what does activism mean to me? Uh, so I'm an activist theater concentration, uh, as was mentioned, uh, which was actually a concentration that I helped uh, create with the head of the Department um, of Women's Studies because I think that one of the most important parts of activism to me uh, is the intersection between politics and art and the way that those two things engage with one another. Um, that is a particularly troubling intersection uh, because so much of art is political. Um, and art is inherently political, but in some ways, um, art and politics are dichotomous, um, and art should be seen as outside of, outside of politics and just art in and of itself. Um, but we also have to understand that uh, art does not exist in a vacuum um, and that will inherently have political consequences, uh, specifically as we're talking about actors and theater um, and who is cast in which specific roles and which types of people um, are being represented uh, across all sorts of mediums. So to me, activism centers a lot around art, um, around performance, but also a lot just around dialogue and conversations that we're having with one another. Specifically, as the election is coming up, I found that so much of activism is having conversations with people around you, educating, empowering. Um, those are two of the most important things, I think, is standing up, specifically when you are in moments of privilege and power, um, and when other folks don't have the opportunity to do that. Specifically with family members, um, if someone is saying something problematic or being apathetic um, in the face of injustice, saying something about it, questioning, having that dialogue with them, having that hard conversation, even though it's uncomfortable, even though these are people that you love, um, doing it so that someone else doesn't have to, that's activism to me. Nadia, I, know, I noticed you're nodding your head um, and I, <laughs> quite frequently uh, as Rowan was speaking, and I know how much art means to your activism. Can you talk a little more about that with us, what activism yeah. and art mean to you? Sure, yeah. Like, like Rowan, I feel like art is a huge part of activism. There is the work that is done on the ground, protesting, organizing, but there's also um, creating space in order for people to process. As a dancer, that's something I, I really enjoy doing and um, just allowing people to process what's going on, to grieve various situations, and like Rowan said, to create a community and awareness as well. A huge part of activism for me as well is acknowledging the emotional labor that goes into it, and I feel like art is a really amazing way in order for that emotional labor to be processed in community and um, expressed for others to see. Thank you. Uh, Janet, we did, I didn't have a chance to read everybody's long bios, but I know you have been doing activism since your Barnard days up until now. In fact, you even tried to get me to go to a demonstration today. So I wonder if you could talk to, to truth. I'm telling the truth. I only tell the truth. Um, uh, could you, could you, could you, could you uh, tell us what activism means to you and how that plays out in your life? Well, I was raised in a, a liberal Jewish tradition um, that, uh, so I thought coming up that activism was, uh, in Hebrew it's called tikkun ha'olam, which is repairing the world. Um, well, when I was younger, which was like a week ago, that's kind of the way I looked at it. Now I kind of see it more as mucking out the Aegean stable. But two, two things remain true about activism, that 
there's, um, it, it's, it's impossible to say what's more or less important. Um, I have to say that, you know, a few, a, a few suburbs away from me, Hillary Clinton was being taught the John Wesley um, thing about doing as much good as possible for as long as you ever can. And it, it you know, basically amounts to two things. One is finding something that you have passion for um, and it doesn't, it's not so much um, um, how many people you affect, because I knew when I was a teacher, um, uh, the little things that I did had uh, effects I couldn't possibly imagine, but, but um, my students came back to me later and told me about them. So you never know exactly. So all you can do is find something you're passionate about, do it as well as you can, find that intersection between something that's going to make life better for other people and something that you really love to do. And above all, show up. Thank you. Um, Carla, can you share with us what activism looks like for you and in your life? I'm afraid of the word activism. You know, I, I can, I can uh, confess that I um, resist the idea that I'm an activist, and yet, when I look back uh, over my life or I pick up a book and notice, oh, I was in that picture. <laughs> it's like, I'm one of those little characters who's on the edge of history, you know? And I said, well, how did I get there if I'm not an activist? Well, I, I think it was um, realizing that in order to be fully whoever you are um, intended to be or have the potential to be, um, when society isn't, doesn't, give you enough space, you have to push. You have to push back. And I think that's how I ended up on this panel, even though <laughs> I'm not an activist. I just am a person, though, who has to live fully. And so back in 1967 and 68, I had to push back because we were not able to live fully. And um, I'll stop there. <laughs> I'll stop there. Thank you. I just. Um I want to give Catherine a chance to respond to this. Uh, you, uh, you are doing many different things than when you were here, so can you talk with us about your activism, what it looks like now? Um, so I often think of activism, there are, as we were talking, I think there are places of activism and there are state, there are phases of activism where activism is a process. So I think of activism now as, so there's where I, there's the, the personal relationships, which I think Rowan, um, Nadia talked about. Um, there's where I work, there's where I play, there's where I worship. And every single arena is a place of potential activism. Um, so, and then there's, there, there are this, I would call the, the activism process. And I think Nadia mentioned that rest processing is a really important piece of activism. Um, in one of the organizations I'm involved with called the Pachamama Alliance, whose vision is that we can, if we put our collective mind to it, we really can create um, a spiritually fulfilling, socially just, and environmentally sustainable planet if we put our mind to it. And I bring that up because spiritually fulfilling is an important piece. So the inner, the inner piece, so one of the things I have done and someone called it recently, there's the, the transformational movement that I have been a part of. Um, so our relationship with ourself is a reflection of the relationship outside. So doing work, spiritual work with yourself is a part, I believe, a part of activism. Um, now I am involved in the Pachamama Alliance. I've been involved in the class, taking an active stand, and I think making the movies we've done is a form of activism, although I have wondered about that. But there's a personal arena. I personally made a choice um, to uh, marry a black man, and I have a child. Um, unfortunately, the relationship didn't last, but I've raised a child. So I have also been active in experiencing and, and working on social justice issues in a very, very personal way with my child. Thank you. I, I, I can see from the responses that we're getting that Activism means different things uh, and some similar things to each of you. And I want to also say, um, from my standpoint, uh, activism is a big word and it can mean many different things. But activism is also different than organizing. And sometimes I think 
activism becomes too big a word for some of us. It doesn't mean being in the streets, although it can mean that, but it doesn't mean simply that. So I just want to put that out there to the distinctions between you can be an activist and be doing uh, the principal thing no matter where you are, no, more, no matter how small the action. So um, as we all know, this is a very different time. Um, and as Tina alluded to, we didn't anticipate um, uh, having the, the, the discussion we're having in the, in the, in the aftermath of uh, this uh, election. So can I ask you to uh, address the question of what kind of activism, what kind of activism have you seen um, since uh, the election uh, a little over a week ago? Dominic, I'm going to start with you. And also, could you um, start off by saying, I didn't mean to miss you, um, uh, what activism means to you? Hmm. Thank you. I really want to echo Miss Carla. Carla, I'm still in that in between space of whether to call you Miss or not. So I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm just going to say, I'm going to echo her. Um, and really share that activism in identities of activists is something that's very new to me, something that I continue to reject. It's not a label that I'm comfortable with having, though I'm completely aware that a lot of the, the causes that I have, a lot of the things that I do involve representation, expanding representation, involve expanding narratives, ex expanding voices, or even giving access to people who don't have voices. So I guess a lot of what activism means to me is having an intention of making some type of social change that benefits the greater community. And with that, I'm moving into this idea of activism, still not labeling myself yet, but that's another story. <laughs> um, and then in terms of what's going on with this election, I will say for me, it's, it's been awakening. I think before the election, I was politically ambiguous. I didn't want to completely involve myself. I felt it was beyond what I needed as a person, so I backed up from it. Ironically, there's been spaces that have been created on Barnard's campus, which I definitely think are forms of activism, that have deconstructed politically what's happened, that has allowed spaces, as Nadia was talking about, to process and grieve. That's a part of the Writing Fellow Center, a writing center, excuse me, um, mission statement. And then also spaces to do something. So I've been really involved with that and definitely becoming more and more engaged with this idea of one, making the decision every day to do something and, and make a change and still trying to figure out exactly what that means, but talking with people who also have that same sentiment. Are there, are there roles um, that the different generations um, can be playing at this time in our history in this country? Can we start with you, Nadia? Okay. Wow, that's, that's a really big question. Um, are there roles for generations? I think there, there are, just because of my desire um, in the work that I do, wanting to know what people have done before me. I think sometimes, um, College students feel like we're reinventing the wheel. We're trying to figure out how to do things from scratch. And I know um, just from learning about some Barnard alums like Ntozaki Shange, who really taught me how to incorporate dance into processing life, into creating space, into building community, into talking about really hard issues. And there's so, there's so much to learn um, from those who have gone before us. And I would really love to see more conversation being created. So I think creating conversation and um, honoring those who have gone before us and doing our homework, really, and learning and, and not feeling like we have to reinvent the wheel, but really standing on the shoulder of giants and, um, and building what's already been started. So I think that's a role for um, all, all generations, really. Rowan, I want to give you a chance because I know you have to leave soon. All right. Um, okay, I'm going to combine my answer to the last two questions a little bit. Um, I had an infuriating conversation with my father today. Um, in which he said something along the lines of, I can't look at newspapers right now, I can't look on Facebook, I can't look, turn on the news, I can't look at TV, anything like that, it's too painful. Um, I advise that you do the same. Um, nothing is happening right now that we can do anything about. Um, 
essentially nothing nothing has occurred that that we can stop yet um, I did not know how to respond to that at first, and then I sent him a very lengthy text message in response. Um, <laughs> and I think one thing that we need to think about here is everything that's happened post the election, everything that will happen post election is not new. These are all things that have been going on since the beginning of this country. Um, and just because there are more coming to the forefront than they have been in the last couple of years doesn't mean that they weren't in existence. Um, and it doesn't mean that they won't continue to happen, and it doesn't mean that they won't, that they aren't happening right now. Um, and so, Apathy is unacceptable in, in this day, um, especially for older generations, I think working within your community, um, especially communities who think that this is something that is new and that we can wait until January um, to do anything about, that's the first step, talking to people within your communities, um, really working out a plan of what, what are the next steps, educating one another. Um, my father is a teacher, and so that's one of the things that I said to him is I was like, you have a great talent for education, Use it. Now is the time. Um, I think on top of other, generation, uh, other generational issues that we can work on is being more respectful of one another. I think one of the largest issues right now that's going on politically is that um, our generation has this misconceived notion that, that we're above other generations and that we're more radical and more progressive. Um, and older generations have been pushing back against that and obviously there's been a lot of backlash and it's meaning that we're not having conversations with one another as Nadia was saying. We're not communicating and we need to learn from what older generations have learned so we don't make the same mistakes and history doesn't repeat itself. Thank you, you you've mentioned uh, twice now um, how important it is to talk to people, to talk to people uh, in our families, to talk to people in our communities, however we define community. Um, in terms of how the generations are similar or different on this issue, can um, you, Carla, talk a little bit about that? About, is that different from, you Well, know, I work on, I have worked on college campuses, um, I guess, all of my working life. And, um, I've never been um, very courageous when it comes to doing something that might get me arrested. I'll be very honest about that. Um, and so whenever there's talk about, you know, of the need for a demonstration or something, I'm, I'm always a little hesitant. Um, but I realized through all of these years, I've been there to open the way for a more courageous group of people who follow me you know, younger people who um, don't have the same fears that I have, but I can make the call to the vice president at Northwestern, for example, make a call to the vice president and say, uh, you know, yeah, that's us, we're out there, we're in the street, and he says, okay, just make sure that they don't do this. So I've been an intermediary, um, and it, you know, as I get older and continue to work in colleges, that's the role that I play. I speak with students, and um, sometimes I say, you know, um, you know, essentially I say, go do what you have to do, but try not, try not to be overly antagonistic. <laughs> uh, you know, I try to try to um, inject, perhaps, a, a, you know, a, what can you say, an element of um, kindness, and um, and I try to steady students and say, um, not this too shall pass, but hold on, things look very dark, mm -hmm. but you're standing on the shoulders of generations. Mm -hmm. be, be calmed by that. So I, you know, the role that I often play is one to support, to um, maybe moderate, um, if they want to take over the president's house, I might say, well, well, you know, um, <laughs> I think that that the quad would be much more open space, and you know, try to try to move the current a little bit, you know, off to the side so that we don't have to have some major confrontation. But um, I do see myself as a person who has lived vicariously through the younger generation, and and my role in that has been to translate sometimes what they have they want to say and very you know hashtag FDT. Uh, I might translate that um, <laughs> to another generation in much more um, cordial terms and, and try to, you know, bring mm -hmm. generations together. So that's, that's the role that I play. So on this side of the table, the left side, 
we have actually um, two, if not three, uh, different approaches. We have someone who's, t you know, just Carla, what Carla just said, and then we have Janet. Could you talk about your approach uh, uh, in terms of uh, what Janet's talking about? She's working in the college, trying to support others, uh, being in, you know, compassionate, pushing, acknowledging uh, that uh, they need support and encouragement. But in you, on the other, in demonstrations are not her thing. But you, you they have another from, approach. If I'm standing behind the pillar and watching, <laughs> you know, they're my fans, like, yes! And that's okay. <laughs> These are just the same generation in two different ways of coming at um, uh, activism, if you will. Well, um, I'll give you a, an example. Um, I have a friend, Dahlia, who's in her early 30s, who a, 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 runs a, a women's organization. And Dahlia will call me up and say, Janet, we need you at the early demo because um, uh, you're not working in an office. You know, you can, you can make it. And I know you like to go to bed early, so you go to the, you go, you know. <laughs> and Dahlia will say to me, Janet, this is a, a demonstration about the rights of women of color, so we're gonna defer, they're gonna lead us and we're gonna defer to them and they're gonna tell us um, what they wanna do. So I, I think I, I confer a lot less wisdom um, than Carla does, I just, uh, I just follow orders. <laughs> but uh, put differently, two each according to uh, uh, um, her needs and from each according to her abilities. And um, if it, it really, you know, the, the, the rule is, the rule is you figure out what you're good at and what you have to listen to others about. And just follow that rule and uh, age is just a number. <laughs> So in a moment, we're going to break and go to the tables for conversation. Before we do that, I want to give any of you an opportunity to add a comment. Dummy. Yes. So I really want to add to this idea of, of intergenerational conversations that we've been having, specifically because so the very, the very first protest that inducted me into this whole idea was this Occupy the Quad type space that happened about two years ago um, when a bunch of students were like, we don't want the marching band on our campus. We're going to occupy the quad and keep them from coming into the gates, right? So fun. I was scared. I was nervous. I'm like, what is happening? Um, and I remember one because I, I didn't know what to do, right? But I went on Barnard's policies and was like, oh, snap, if we get, if we like obstruct exits, like they can expel us. And I'm, I don't, I'm not trying to get expelled. So I shared that with some of the people who were leading the organization. I was like, okay, let's, let's try to figure this out. So instead, we decided to stay around the perimeter, right? Um, and then, then I was still like, I'm not about to be in this line because I don't want anybody touching my body. So I'll walk around and like take pictures and do voice recordings and stuff, right? So that's what I did. And I remember on that day, Dean Hinkson, President Spar, and I think some other deans showed up because it was also on the night of midnight breakfast. So we just disrupted everything. Mm -hmm. um, they came out, and I remember I was like, I was just trying to figure out what I'm going to do, what type of I don't know. So I decided to go up to Dean Hinkson. I was like, can I interview you? Can you say a few words about what's going on? And this is my first time really having a connection with Dean Hinkson because I just, you know, you hear a lot about your deans. You never know what to do. So in that conversation or even in that brief moment, when you're talking about like intergenerational activism, she was telling me basically that the administration is here for the students. Like, we're here to serve the support of the students and the needs of the students, but one, you have to let us know what's going on, um, and two, you have to be willing to understand, like, legality, legality issues. Um, and that's, like, a poor summarization of everything, but I think in that moment, when I move forward now, I understand that, one, I see allyship in my administration, but I also have to be aware of legalities, and I also have to be willing to come to the table consistently about what I want and what I need. And I say that also again because in the past two, like two weeks ago or so, um, Boss put on this other event where we were talking about archives and taking up a lot of space. Oh, snap. Um, I'll just be quickly. Um, we're talking about archives and really wanting, to deal in, really wanting to dabble into what Boss has done in the past in terms of the 10 demands and like, what was Miss um, Francis doing then, and everything of that matter, right? And we got the history kind of wrong, 
but they were in the audience and they were willing to one reach out and say, you got it wrong, let's clarify for the next time. So a lot of the places that I've been in in terms of intergenerational activism is like, one, identifying what I want to do and also consistently reaching out and like your follow-up game as us millennials has to be strong because everybody is just like busy. Um, so yeah. <laughs> okay, I think, um, yes, of course, go ahead. Um, Bri just briefly so we can break. All right. Yeah. I, I think that um, coming from 1968, and I did choose to go into the buildings and, and, and get arrested, so I was very involved, that um, one of the things that this generation can pass on and what we learned is that civil disobedient, nonviolent civil disobedience is the way change happens. So to how to help channel the anger and the frustration that wants to, that wants to in the moment, wants to break. I can understand that energy and that, and, and that desire. And I also know from experience, it's not what creates change. So from the metaphysical perspective, one of the ways to think about it is, if I can accept what is, it doesn't mean I agree with it, but to see what is, to decide if I want to take a stand. And if taking that stand means, and I'm going to go to the extreme, that I would need to make war. But here's the key. What's the energy with which I take a stand? If I can make war without love or hatred or shame or blame, that is the key. The energy with which I take a stand is what results in a change happening. If I'm coming at you like this, what do you want to do? You want to come back like that. If I can come at you and say, I disagree, and I'm going to stand here in my disagreement without blaming you or shaming you, then things can change. And that would be the wisdom, I would say, one of the things our generation can pass on. All right, we're, we're going to... I just want, I, All right, they're, they're rebelling. It's a revolution. <laughs> um, Finally, a revolution. I, okay. Like everyone else, um, the, the results of the election has really weighed heavily on me. And mm -hmm. um, I was walking into work, um, not as sprightly as usual. I was just sort of dragging along, thinking about, oh, God, what's, what's this day going to bring? And I noticed um, bright yellow, nine um, by, what is it, nine and a half by 11 sheets, uh, posted here and there along what we call the long walk at Trinity. I wish I could remember exactly what was written on those yellow squares, but it was something to the order of um, love is the preeminent, you know, it wasn't all fancy like that, but it wasn't love trumps hate, but it was something on that order. It was something like love is the most important value. Um, be kind to one another. And this was generated by students who were feeling um, really frightened and uh, a great deal of pain about the results of um, the recent election. We know, too, that there is going to be a demonstration this coming Thursday. Uh, and, and some of us who um, wear various deanly titles um, have agreed to talk with the students we know best and encourage uh, that when they go out, they go out in the right spirit. Um, because we know that there are other students on the campus who um, are celebrating this victory and who are not going to be inclined to open their hearts and see the pain and the fear and the terror that um, really has been unleashed by um, all of the very negative rhetoric mm -hmm. and the fact that um, a certain person did win that election. So we want to make sure that when the students who are in pain, and their numbers are great, but when they go out, they go out with, with a spirit that is loving and that does hopefully cause those who stand on the other side uh, to suspend uh, an immediate fight back response, but opens their hearts to understand why this is such a frightening time for so many. I think on that we will turn to our audience. And so I'm going to ask you to do a few things. We want it to be a multi-generational discussion at this moment. So we want you to look around at your table and make some judgments. If they're, <laughs> it's, in this case, I'm saying it's OK to judge. And try to disperse yourselves in a way 
So we've got different generations at each table. All right, go ahead. Thank you. So the first one was connecting um, to make change happen. The second is persistence. To get things to happen legislatively requires showing up again and again. Um, third, to communicate and to be able to translate for different audiences. And uh, fourth, to have your own intentions clear and to know what's acceptable compromise for you. Um, next, um, that practical things are important. So we had the example of when organizing, setting up some kind of child care that will allow women to participate mm -hmm. since women are still primary caregivers. So like being aware of just practical things like that that are necessary before people can actually show up. And we also talked about the importance of the involvement of youth. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to ask, in the interest of time, and we have so many more people uh, showing up tonight in tables, so I'm going to ask each group to give one point from Thank you for all of that, though. <laughs> so I think one of the things we really talked about was just like looking at history and like change and, and seeing um, how change isn't linear, but that that's kind of how we often feel or we want change to look like. Um, and a second point that we revolved around a lot was like the role of art, right? And the role of art, um, you know, aside from like thinking things logically and like a lot of us have that tendency to want to think about change and change strategically and logically, how do we use art and the different forms of art to like emotionally change how people feel towards one another and towards what's happening around them? Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Talking about community and building community and uh, finding your community, and but also something that was said was expanding your definition of community and trying to find commonalities between people um, that you may have like ideological differences with, but finding commonalities of being human and feeling empathy and things like that in order to expand your community and, yeah. Talked at the beginning about how change happens through sort of a variety of ways, so one being big demonstrations that we can all see, but that those Demonstrations that do achieve policy change and institutional change can't happen without interpersonal relationship building where people grow to change their opinions and understand each other better. I think that resonates a lot with what you guys said about willingness to have conversations with people that we don't agree with in all ways. Thank you. Um, so we talked about some of the controversial issues of how to um, whether to work with institutions um, against them or outside of institutions and some of the complexities of that since, as we've discussed, um, a lot of structural inequalities are ingrained in institutions and how to navigate some of the challenges that we've had um, on campus um, with representation, like notably like the sciencing of activists, um, advocating for different social justice issues, especially for low-income students. So we had kind of a non-linear conversation, which I think is good, but something that I think is that we kind of decided was the most important thing that came out was the issue of race in this election and post-election responses to race, how white people seem to have been really shocked by this, whereas a lot of people of color were really, have been experiencing these kind of things for their entire lives. Um, and that this, hopefully a silver lining in this is maybe that white people will like kind of finally show up for some of these issues and have awoken to the racism in the country. Um, and we didn't talk about this, but one thing I also want to say that I didn't get to mention in our conversation <laughs> is that <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm taking the stage. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to say that I think this is also like, as a white person really awoken me to how um, much the kind of like mainstream and majority white press has already after the election started to make this a narrative of class rather than race. And I think there's this mm -hmm. unwillingness to be really honest about mm -hmm. the kind of racism that has existed in the entire campaign, in the election right. and in this country. And I think it's just really important to pay attention to how the press continues to cover this. I thank you for lifting up that very important uh, issue. Thank you. Having the courage to change oneself, um, commanding attention, and sometimes change happens unexpectedly when our interior and exterior circumstances coalesce. How are you a change agent? We can incorporate activism into normal life. We can stay involved in movements and we can try persuasion one person at a time. What kind of support do you need? Inspiration. 
What kind of support can you offer community? Thank you. Next table. Uh, we thought it was important to focus on a tangible target, um, choose one target and, and stick to your, your goals in terms of uh, getting that change. And then we also discussed um, taking back the word change. Uh, it's kind of taken on a negative tone in this election. And we want to take back the word change as a positive driving force, driving us forward, not backwards. Fantastic, thank you. Next table. We also focused on challenging uh, the dominant media narratives um, and examining how uh, those narratives serve uh, to, to blankly explain uh, issues that are far more rooted and more complex and uh, also talking about that the communities that are most at risk, uh, worst should go first, um, so we should use our, our, this platform as a way to talk more about intersectional advocacy and intersectional identity and focusing on the, the intersections of identities that are most marginalized and those communities should go first when we start to reorganize and gather. Thank you, great. Next table. Um, how does change happen? Um, we, I just circled a bunch of things. One thing said recognition of a problem. Uh, and not only an intent, but a commitment to rectifying the problem, which will involve conflict, uh, as well as conflict resolution. And another thing we said is that you know, we're gonna have these leaders, meaning I think people who hold power, who may or may not be in your movement, they may be you know, against your movement, and being cognizant of how they respond to what you're doing. Um, how do we see our changes? That was very diverse. We did have a very good intergenerational crowd, so everything from feeding people information to feeding people actual food, uh, to inspiration, and it's not on my paper, but I'll add perspiration. <laughs> um, and also just sort of recognizing your part, like your relationship, that you are you know, sort of part of something larger um, is, is important um, for a lot of different reasons. And then, last question, what kind of support would you like? Oh, one thing that came up, we didn't really answer that, but one thing that came up was this idea of, of accountability and, and, and thinking about accountability and helping each other to be accountable. Um, and, and one thing that I threw out there and will throw out there now is that a lot of times what you're working on has, it has a moral dimension. And get on the firm moral ground and, and defend it. Great. Well, um, two, two observations. One, very organically, all the report backs were very multi-generational. So, and you didn't check in with each other, so congratulations. And all of the points, at least those that you reported back, are all really, uh, in some cases, different, but very much in alignment with each other. So give yourselves a big hand. So we're going to ask you to do uh, one more thing. Uh, and as you're doing it, I'm going to be talking to you. So we're going to ask you to do two things at once. Multitasking is overrated, but I'm going to ask you to do it anyway. Um, so first, what we'd like to know, and if you would take a sheet of paper on and cut it in half, let's cons uh, conserve here. Um, there's pads on the table. And what we would like you to do, and then give back to us, is. What would you like to come back and talk about? You know, you can name, you know, a few things, a whole sentence, bullet points. So that's what we went. And, and then the other, on the other side of the paper, what we would like to know is, based on tonight, or maybe not just on tonight, but based on tonight, informed by tonight, what's one thing you may do in the next couple of days? So just to wrap up, just a few other um, comments. Is part of, the, part of the reason behind those two questions is because we don't necessarily, we wanted to begin a conversation, but we're not, no, we're not quite sure how to continue it, right? And there will be a number of different meetings, um, uh, motions, actions, 
conferences in the coming days and weeks. This is just one, and the, what's been special about it is that it's brought together alums and different generations of Barnard uh, constituencies. So we're not sure what the way forward is. We first of all, though, appreciate that you all took the time to come back, that you all had the opportunity to have a conversation at the table, and that you have even any kind of conceptual willingness of what it means to act intergenerationally. So in closing, we will be collecting your, um, we'll be collecting your pieces of paper. But again, just a really, really immense thanks to all of our panelists, to all the alums who've come back, to all of the members of our community, past, present, and future. Thank you so much.